ladies and gentlemen, and also those who are online this evening uh, at this uh, inaugural lecture of our colleague, Professor Dion Foster. Colleagues, without any further ado, let me introduce or bring to the podium our Dean of the Faculty of Theology, Professor Reginald Nell, who will welcome everybody and also the family and those who are online. Thank you, please. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Makoto. Good evening, everybody. Goeienaand, Moweni Bootlawam. The inaugural professorial lecture celebrates the culmination point of one's path as an academic. It celebrates, looks back, but also sets an agenda for future work. It is a moment of deep significance for the individual professor, but also for us as a scholarly community, uh, and then, of course, also for us as a faculty, the university, and also the particular scholarly society that one participates in. And so tonight, as Dean, I welcome you at this moment of our history uh, in, also in the history of Professor Dion Foster. Allow me, uh, as uh, Ukraiha Maokoto has already done, to acknowledge and welcome a few uh, people who are here. In the first place, we want to welcome the person of the moment, uh, Professor Dion Foster. We want to acknowledge his family, uh, Megan and the children, Courtney and Liam, other family members who have joined online, we understand Mag Megan's dad also sh share this moment with us, Dion's brother and his sister, who have also joined us online. Our colleagues, I met Dion more or less 15 years ago uh, when we, uh, when I was still at my previous institution, organized a conference reading the classics. And Dion presented a paper on Karl Barth, a very systematic theological paper. But then already he was, as a young man, uh, I can attest to that he already showed a lot of potential. <laughs> <laughs> Never did we know at the time that one day we would share, uh, you know, as colleagues, this moment. I want to also, and uh, Dr. Makoto has done it, welcome and acknowledge the presence of uh, members of the university's rectorate, the leadership, uh, Professor Nika Koopman, the DVC for Social Impact Transformation and Personnel, and of course also Professor Stan Duplessis, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the university, uh, and also a member of the Bayes Nadir uh, Center for Public Theology Board. We want to acknowledge member of the academy. Um, and I've noticed on the list that some of our colleagues have joined us online. Uh, Professor John Clarsen uh, of our sister institution, the University of the Western Cape, the chair of the department there. Professor Rodney Chaka, who is a school director, School of Humanities at UNISA. Uh, many colleagues who have uh, indicated that they will join Professor Rudolf von Sinner, and uh, I've also seen some of our emeritus professors here tonight, and I want to in particular acknowledge Professor Charles Villa Vicencio, uh, who has also joined us tonight. Welcome, Professor Villa Vicencio. We want to acknowledge uh, members of the clergy who are here, uh, the president of the South African Council of Churches of the Western Cape, Dr. Lionel Lowe. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lowe. Uh, mem other members of the clergy, I also want to acknowledge the Bishop um, of the Methodist Church here in the Cape Province, Yvette Moses, Bishop Yvette Moses, uh, and, and a spouse, uh, Reverend uh, Ralph Alfgang, who is also with us here tonight, um, and various other members of the clergy. Uh, I have also, uh, and I'm excited to welcome a former chaplain now, faculty now, the Dean um, at the uh, Cathedral in Somerset West, Dr. Ron, Ronald Phillips. W welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Phillips. And then, of course, many other members of the clergy. 
Uh, welcome also to all our students who are here tonight. Um, students of Professor Foster as well as a student broader of, of him that, that uh, he supervised, but also current students uh, who are with us. Welcome to our administrative and support staff. And here I want to acknowledge the team uh, under the leadership uh, of our faculty manager and Divine uh, Robinson uh, who have made this possible, who have organized this event. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that they've done a fine job. And, and we want to acknowledge that. And then, of course, we also want to acknowledge and thank Jonathan Dale and his team uh, who have also uh, together uh, made it possible for us uh, to be here tonight. So, over the past weekend, I had a very important, I thought, uh, exploratory meeting with some key leaders globally, and we agreed that one of the key strategic decisions to impact not only our continent, uh, but also societies in the South, including South Asian, uh, the South Asian context, Latin America, will be the formation of leaders, religious leaders, who will make a strategic impact on the public issues of the day. Issues like inequality, climate change, and interreligious and intercultural tensions. And this is also what we will reflect on tonight as we reflect on public theology. Living more decently in an indecent world. The virtues and vices of a public theologian. And I believe that tonight, arguably one of the world leading, South Africa's leading young organic intellectuals will set the scene for us. So tonight I welcome you at the inaugural professoral lecture of Professor Dion uh, Foster. Thank you, Dean. Uh, now, colleagues, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Professor Robert Foslo, who is the acting head of the department, who will introduce our colleague, Professor Dion Foster. Uh, Professor uh, Koopman, uh, Professor Duplessis, our Dean, Professor Nell, Dr. Maokoto, uh, colleagues, friends, and also family of Professor Foster. Uh, it's a, a great privilege for me to introduce Professor Foster uh, tonight on this occasion of his inaugural address as full professor within the discipline group of systematic theology uh, and ecclesiology at the Faculty of Theology here at Salamash University. Now, in, in the booklet that you, uh, most of you might have received at the doors, there's some biographical information about Professor Foster, such as that he was born in Zimbabwe and that he grew up in South Africa. Also that after high school he went on to study electrical engineering. But fortunately for the church and the academy, and probably to the detriment of ESCOM and the unfolding of the history of load shedding in our country, uh, Dion was accepted as a Methodist lay preacher and started to study theology through UNISA. In 1990, he entered the ministry of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, and after his studies at Rhodes University, he was ordained in 1998 as a minister of word and sacraments, and subsequently serving in several cross-cultural church contexts. Now, over the, the years, he also excelled as an academic theologian, as is seen in the fact that he received his PhD in systematic theology uh, from UNISA in 2005 uh, with the title Self-Validating Consciousness in Strong Artificial Intelligence, an African Theological Contribution, a topic that I think is uh, gaining also in relevance. In 2017, he received a second uh, PhD uh, in New Testament Studies from Radboud University uh, in the Netherlands this time with a thesis entitled The Impossibility of Forgiveness, an Empirical Intercultural Reading of Matthew uh, 80. Now I, I can say a, a lot more ab about his academic work, but let me add that before joining the discipline group of systematic theology and ecclesiology uh, as a lecturer, senior lecturer in public theology and ethics, 
Dion also served as dean of the John Wesley College. This was from 2002 till 2008. And in various other capacities, including as a lecturer and a workplace chaplain. Currently, he serves, uh, or uh, we can say uh, that he serves as the chairperson of our discipline group of systematic theology and ecclesiology, and also as the director of the Bayer's Nudia Center for Public Theology. And those of us who work closely with him uh, can testify that, that he does this with great distinction, dedication, and passion. We are tr truly privileged and blessed to work alongside him. And if I can quote the words that he often bestows on others and echo it back to himself, we can say, Do you, Dion, you are indeed a gift. <laughs> Dion's appointment as full professor was no surprise given the high quality of his academic research, publications, teaching, and supervision. He is an internationally recognized theologian that has played a major role in public theological discourses both nationally and globally. His stature is acknowledged by the fact that he is a research fellow at Wesley House, Cambridge, and has spent time as visiting professor and researcher at various prestigious uh, institutions. Now, this is not the time to go into the detail of all uh, the books written and edited by Dion. It's extensive. Uh, and to say about these other outputs and academic accolades. Suffice it to say that it's all very impressive and that we as a, fa as a faculty are, are really proud about your achievements and also the recognition that you've earned. We are probably uh, more, in, more than this also uh, want to say something that it's telling about your witness uh, that you, you keep company with some other remarkable people. And uh, here we want, what would like specifically uh, to mention Megan, your wife, that is here. Uh, she recently complete, completed a PhD in educational policy studies. And also here we you have your children, uh, Courtney, who's busy in, with her honors in political sciences, and, and your son, uh, who is in grade nine at Parle uh, Falay High School in Somerset West. Liam, uh, we would also like to welcome the three of you, especially here together with other family. Now, as I uh, mentioned, I don't want to say too much, but maybe in these moments I can uh, make a comment or three, taking into account the title of your address tonight, Dion, Living More Decently in an Indecent World, The Virtues and Vices of Public Theology. Now, I will not say something about the virtues and vices of public theology, but allow me to mention three virtues or loves of sorts that comes to mind when I think about Dion. The first of these is his love of movement. <laughs> Those who know him or just follow him on social media will know that, Leon, that Dion loves to jog, to cycle, to move around. And he does this in an infectious way that draws others into journeying with him. And hereby he enriches many lives. It is indicative of his outreaching personality and theology. In this sense too, he is a public theologian. And in the spirit of the best of Wesleyan and ecumenical theology, the world is indeed his parish. Just to balance that, Dion, the, uh, the second virtue is his gift of self-relativization. Now, this gives a certain lightness and fun character to be around Dion. In his company, uh, but, and this I can add, in his company we also know that his humor, reflexi reflexivity, and storytelling is grounded in a deeper calling and spirituality that testify to the fact that he lives his life in communion with God's love and God's grace. And the third, and because I'm reformed, I'll stick to these three, uh, virtue that I would like to highlight in introducing uh, Professor Foster is what I'd like to call his generosity of spirit. It is true of Dion what the Methodist uh, 
Episcopalian theologian Stanley Hauerwas writes about generosity. A generous person is a person of hospitality who is ready to share their lives with others, but also, and even more importantly, to have others share their lives with them. And I can also think uh, of another comment by um, the moral philosopher Spont uh, Volkomte that remarks about generosity that it is multiple in its content and is often combined with other virtues. He writes, coupled with compassion, it becomes benevolence. In league with mercy, it becomes leniency. But its most beautiful name is its secret, an open secret that everybody knows. Accompanied by gentleness, it is called kindness. Professor Foster, we look forward to listening to you tonight. We thank you for your generosity and your kindness and your decency, not only in your personal life, but also in your embodiment of academic excellence. And now we look forward to listen to your professoral address on living decently in an indecent world. Friends, please extend a decent welcome to Professor Foster. Honorable Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Nico Kupman, the Chief Operating Officer of the University, Professor Stan Duplessis, the Dean of our Faculty, Professor Reggie Nell, colleagues, family, and friends, it is with deep gratitude that I present my inaugural lecture this evening. Robert, thank you for your incredibly kind and gracious introduction. As I was preparing for this evening's lecture, I was reminded of the words of Mercy Amba Oduyoye, the Methodist African woman theologian, who says that theology is, I quote, a story that is told, a song that is sung, a prayer that is uttered in response to experience and expectation. And friends, I can say that my life story is fuller because it intersects with each of you. And so thank you to each of you who are here tonight. Indeed, you are a gift. I want to begin by uh, saying just a few words of thanks for those who have made this evening possible. Um, firstly, to Mrs. Divine Robinson for her tireless work, uh, to Eshwa Benjamin, our faculty manager, for all that she has done and for paying the bills. Thank you, Eshwa and Reggie, for signing the checks. Uh, to Jonathan uh, Dale and his team. To Auntie Minnie. Uh, to my friend, Pastor Simba, who drives this uh, contraption here, which is like the Starship Enterprise. Uh, to our colleague, Joseph, and of course, to my colleagues, Sipo, Robert, and Ralph, uh, for your part in this evening's program. And Danielle, thank you so, so much uh, for blessing us with that item tonight and Peter for accompanying her. We are, are truly blessed with that. I also want to say some special thank yous, firstly to my family, uh, to Megan, Dr. Darling as she is now known, uh, to Courtney and to Liam, whose love and support frames so much of how I think about the world. My life is good and it is good because of you. I also want to thank my close colleague, uh, Mrs. Vilma Rickett, alongside whom I work most closely in the Department of Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology. Vilma uh, often speaks of herself as my mitarbeiter. We work together, and Vilma, you do it with such grace and with such attention to detail, covering over a million shortcomings with, pa uh, with patience and with poise. Thanks for all that you do. And then I also want to acknowledge and thank the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, represented tonight by my bishop, the Reverend Yvette Moses, and my own minister, Reverend Elf, uh, Ralph Afghan. 
The church taught me what it is to be a person of prayer, of study, who is directed towards justice. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity that you grant me to serve in this uh, position as I'm seconded as a minister. I also want to say a huge word of thanks to my colleagues in the Department of Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology and the Bayes Medea Center for Public Theology. Uh, first of all, for putting up with me. I don't think I'm the easiest person <laughs> at times. And thank you for always listening to my stories. And most of all, thank you for the shared work that we get to do. That means so much to me. To Ashwin and Liesel, to Henry, to Des and Jason, to Madness and Sipo, to Nadia and Robert and Vilma, thank you. And now, friends, as we begin this lecture, I want to invite my colleague, Jason Gribble, with whom I work in the Bayes Nadia Center for Public Theology, to come and light this candle for us. As we meet this evening, we want to remember the 47 people who lost their lives between the 12th and 16th of August in 2012 in what has become known as the Marikana Massacre. As I toiled with my thoughts and wrote the text for this evening's lecture, thank you, Jason, their lives and indeed their deaths were present to me. So I'd like to ask you please to take a moment of silence to remember those who, who died 10 years ago. Amen. Now, friends, the tradition of an inaugural lecture is that the newly promoted or appointed professor should have something to profess. Having spent years reading, listening, reflecting, and writing, it's expected that one might have a body of work and perhaps even a few good ideas that are worth sharing. I'm going to leave the judging of the quality of those ideas to you. But my hope is that this lecture, as tentative as it may be, might offer a few points for us to ponder. The lecture tonight engages the strange and veridical paradox that characterizes contemporary life in South Africa. By the way, just to mention, I'll be following my text but skipping some parts, so you might have to do a little bit of gymnastics to follow where I am in the text. The paradox that I'm speaking of is that while 92% of South Africans indicate that they are religious and almost 86% of the population profess to be Christian, we continue to struggle with the individual and systemic indecencies of racism, sexism, poverty, violence, and environmental destruction. Recognizing these realities, I've reflected a great deal about what would be good and right and wise for a Christian theologian to profess. And I realized that answering these questions requires careful and critical reflection upon the complex intersections of faith and public life. Indeed, as Paul Ricoeur said, if we are to live ethically, we will need to understand how we might live, I quote, a good life with and for others within just institutions. The Christian tradition confesses that God is good. Moreover, Christians believe that what God created is good and that God's good creation is intended for good. Now this is both a theological and a political claim that has consequences for both faith and public life. As a Christian who is committed to being formed in the image of Christ, what is fitting and proper or decent to do when one encounters evil? To understand how we might live more decently, I will focus on practicing patience as an antidote to violence, on acting with courage as a commitment to the truth, and on cultivating a prophetic imagination so that our hope for a better world does not remain a mere fantasy. As the question mark in the title signals, this is a project of inquiry. It is tentative 
rather than conclusive. And I hope that my profession embodies something of the virtues that are necessary to be a Christian theologian, indeed the virtues required to do the work of an ethicist and public theologian in South Africa today. Now, one of the strange things about my appointment to the Faculty of Theology is that I am not one thing, but in fact two, perhaps even more. Specifically, I was appointed to, the position in public, to a position in public theology and theological ethics. And I'm immensely grateful for this appointment and for all that it allows me to do. I'm expected to spend my time reading, observing, thinking, serving, and contributing from within these fields. Can you imagine anything more cool than that? The philosopher Richard Fleming says that writing one, one's own thoughts for others to read is difficult since we try to mean what we say using words that are not our own. We find our life fated in the language of our ancestors, in the language that we inherit from them. Hence, to understand what words mean, we must understand what those who use them mean. So please be warned, parts of this lecture may be surprisingly personal. Over the years I've said many things about many things and I think that I've enjoyed writing much more than my students and colleagues have enjoyed reading what I write. <laughs> and that's okay, <laughs> it's not going to stop me writing. In part that is because my interests are somewhat diverse and perhaps even a little bit eclectic. In spite of the variety of topics and disciplines that I've engaged in my work to date, there is some coherence, at least there is for me. I believe that I've been engaged in what Nadia Maria calls systematic, unsystematic theology. This is an approach to theology, and I quote from her, which makes, us, which makes use of systematic arguments and analyses without resorting to formulating systematically worked out Christian doctrines. In some sense, I think I've taken my lead from Mercy Amba Odoyoye, who said that instead of, and I quote, telling people what questions to ask and then furnishing them with the answers, a theologian should listen to the questions that people are asking and then seek the answers. This description resonates with how I think about my work as a South African Methodist working in public theology and theological ethics. A great deal of what I have written has dealt with the ethical questions that relate to the character of individuals and communities, connecting contemporary concerns to what we read in the Christian scriptures and what we have come to confess to be the historical traditions of the Christian faith. Now, if I were to identify one common thread that seems to run through all that I have done and all that I am busy doing, I would say that I'm trying to understand how faith in Christ might help people to live more decently in an indecent world. Now, of course, this phrasing is not my own. It comes from the American novelist Kurt Vonnegut. He was once asked how he made sense of living in the midst of the Vietnam War of rising poverty, of political corruption under Richard Nixon, and America's ongoing racial injustice. In answer to this question, he replied, I quote, what made living almost worthwhile for me were the saints I met. They could be anywhere. They are people behaving decently in an indecent society. Now, I often, often tell my students that one approach to the work of theology is to engage the semantic meanings of words and the grammar of sentences. And perhaps this is a reason why I found a home working within the sacred texts of Christianity, particularly the New Testament, and the philosophical and contextual meanings of African Christianities. So first, my work is a journey of seeking to understand and learning what it means to be subject to the radical rule of Jesus. The radically loving, radically peaceful, radically just, radically liberative and inclusive king. Second, 
My work has sought to understand how people live and also how they ought to live. And this requires a sober evaluation of the social imagination, the cultural imagination, and the practices that constitute our lives and the living of them. Third, there is a kind of quality to the life that I long to understand how to live and that I want to encourage others to live. It is the kind of life that can be characterized as decent in a certain sense. Now let's pause for a moment and reflect on the word decent. My understanding of decency is influenced by the definition provided by the philosopher Avishai Margalit. And I must just acknowledge, friends, that most of the best books that I've read in the last decade have been recommended by my colleague Robert Fossler, and this one was amongst them. Margalit asserts that, I quote, a decent society is one whose institutions do not humiliate people. His understanding is shaped by wrestling with the ongoing injustice that Palestinians face under the Israeli occupation. He asserts that it is the confronting of evil that brings us to a politics of decency. Now, while I understand that we should commit our lives fully to the pursuit of justice, Margulit argues that decency is a further step in that pursuit or at times a necessary step along the way to realizing a particular quality of justice. I am convinced that my faith in Christ demands that wherever I identify the humiliating and destructive practices of evil, the decent thing to do, indeed the proper thing to do, the thing that is both fitting and suitable, is to confront it. So why the emphasis on discerning how to live decently rather than just advocating for living justly? Well, first, I take it for granted that Christians should live in a way that establishes justice in the world. That should not be argued for. Why? Well, because God is just and we are to be just in our human affairs since God, since God is jealous for justice. The second uh, point that I make is that I doubt that there are many people of conscience and even fewer people of sincere Christian faith who would dispute that justice for all of humanity and all of creation is not a worthy ideal to pursue. However, where the problem arises is when there are disagreements about what constitutes justice. Now let me illustrate this by a very important historical example. The Marikana massacre, during which 47 people were killed at the Lonman mine exactly 10 years ago today, was unsurprisingly about the tension between justice and decency. To prepare for this lecture, I went and I read interviews with the miners. And I was surprised to find in a book written by Kate Alexander that the workers' demand was simple. They simply wanted their employer, Lonman, to listen to their case for a decent wage. Now, in labor relations, we have become accustomed to the phrase, a living wage, which serves as a sort of basic minimum that allows workers to subsist. But think about the brutality of a world in which we settle for mere living as an acceptable standard. At Marikana, the workers were clear. They were advocating not only for a living wage, they were holding their employer, indeed their union, to a higher standard. They wanted a decent wage. Now, decency used in this context was more than just basic justice. Decency for the victims of, Marika of the Marikana massacre was about more than just securing the right to subsist, to meet their bare needs for survival. It was about securing a standard of living that could deconstruct the historical indecencies of migrant labor, the separation of families, of living in poverty, and of being dehumanized and humiliated by rich and powerful people and institutions. 
The question that Christ might ask, indeed that Christians should ask, is what would be the decent thing to do so that no person is dehumanized, abused, or humiliated, so that no injustice is done while the dispute of justice is being settled? This is how I understand decency. And I'm careful to differentiate Margaret's understanding of a decent society from some understandings of decency that are used to separate and humiliate people rather than respect and recognize them. I realize that decency has been misused by some religious communities over the centuries as a form of exclusion based on moral judgments about what is considered indecent. Indecent, for example, in, certain, in terms of sexual behaviors, forms of dress, and types of spe speech. In her book, Menschenrechte in Menschenpflichten, Aleida Asman argues that in times of political, cultural, and moral dispute, the ability to, to treat difference with respect, empathy, and humility serve to help societies deal with some very difficult political, social, and moral concerns. Robert Fosler contends that the communicative, uh, communicative behavior where others are not humiliated, insulted, or hurt, which is a form of empathetic decency, played an important role in dealing with different, difference, conflict, and even injustice over the centuries. This is the way in which I hope my work has sought to think about decency as a form of engagement both in thought and action that addresses some of the immediate yet larger evils of our time, such as poverty, racism, sexism, violence, and greed, in pursuit of the ultimate end of justice. Now let me say it's not that I think that the world is inherently bad or evil. In fact, quite the opposite. Throughout my life, I have benefited from the kindness and care of others, even from strangers, particularly as a child. And this has left me with a great deal of optimism about the possibility of goodness in the world. I believe that the world and humanity as part of the world are created good. However, I'm also enough of a realist to understand that the world is not currently as it was created to be. Now, friends, here is the first surprise, just before you nod off to sleep. <laughs> Firstly, I do not believe that it is the work of Christians to make the world a better place. Now, why do I believe that? Well, to profess that would be a denial of the very claim that I made just moments ago, that the world and people are created good. No, what I believe is that the role and responsibility of Christians and Christian communities is to live in such a manner that we witness to a way of life that helps all of us to rediscover, indeed to recover, the good that we were created to be. So the world is not ontologically unjust. However, it has become indecent. So I hope that this offers some insight into how I use the term decent to explain the purpose and intention of my work. Now, such a belief has some obvious political implications, and this has necessitated that I engage with the intersections of faith and public life in its varying forms. Hence, you could characterize what I do as a form of public theology. So I'd like to dwell on that for just a few moments. What exactly is public theology? And what is a public theologian? Stanley Hauerwas once wrote an article with the title, How Not to Be a Political Theologian. In the article, he notes in his characteristically wry and humorous way that he must be a political theologian because others have identified him as such. However, much of the article is spent on unpacking the dangers of naming things. He writes, I quote, 
I've always resisted modifying theology with descriptors, with descriptors that suggest it is the possession of certain groups and perspectives. Central to his argument is the common sense claim that all theology, I quote, reflects a politics, whether that politics is acknowledged or not. Hence, he is cautious to speak of political theology, as that might create the impression that some uh, theologies are political, while others are not. Now, friends, I must say that I feel similarly about being identified as a public theologian. You see, for me, all theology has public implications, whether this is acknowledged or not. The South African theologian Nico Koopman sums this up very aptly when he writes that, I quote, the church and the Christian faith exists in public, is part of it, and impacts upon it both knowingly and unknowingly. Similarly, Rudolf von Sinner from Brazil notes, I quote, of course Christianity and theology are public. They are strongly present in everyday life and in the media. They are missionary in different ways, not private and not secret. So while I agree that all theology is public in this broad sense, I would not claim that all theologies are public theologies. Simply stated, I know that the naming of a thing must be done carefully, as it can either be a descriptive or a prescriptive task, and this distinction can be misunderstood. This is true for the terminology that academic theologians use in their research and writing. Hence, some flexibility, indeed generosity, is required in understanding the various meanings and usages of the term public theology. In my recent work, like Dirky Smith, I have highlighted the difference between using the term public theology descriptively. And whenever I do so, I write public theology with a small p and a small t, since the public that is referred to here is an adjective that, that describes the relationship of theology to public life. However, when I use the prescriptive form, I always use a capital P and a capital T, because here it's not an adjective but indeed a noun that names an emerging community of scholars, a certain set of debates, a commitment to studying particular methods and schools of thought, people and normative in, uh, contributions in a field that is called public theology. To my mind, this displays a sensitivity to the notion that public theologies are not and should not be totalizing or all-encompassing. So in relation to these understandings, I am grateful to be able to say that I am a public theologian both in the descriptive sense and in the prescriptive sense. In a descriptive sense, I believe that all theology, including my own work, has public consequences and is informed and shaped by the interaction with public life. In the prescriptive sense, I formally participate in a community of scholars who are part of the Global Network for Public Theology, and I serve as an editor and have published in the International Journal for Public Theology. So in this sense, I resonate with an understanding of the nature and scope of contemporary public theologies as they re relate to the descriptive and prescriptive emergence of this field. Let's move on to the virtues and vices of a public theologian in South Africa today, and I can assure the rectorate I hope not to let anything out the bag that will get me in the newspapers tomorrow. Now, I've been reading the work of the Methodist Episcopal theologian and ethicist Stanley Hauwas for decades now, and this is a joy that I share with many people who have had a significant impact upon my own life, such as my late senior colleague Neville Richardson, uh, my colleagues Robert Fossler, Nico Koopman, and Arne Rasmussen uh, from Sweden, who's joining us online today. Now, while I try to read everything that Hauerwas writes, which is no mean feat, let me tell you, there is one little book that I have read more than any other. I brought it with me tonight. The book is called The Character of Virtue, 
Letters to a God Child. And I can also say, like the other books, this one was first recommended to me by Robert. Now, I find Hauerwas's way of thinking about the world, and particularly Christian hope in the world, very instructive. Hauerwas writes, and I'd like to invite you to listen to this quote. He says, to be a hopeful person means you rightly will want the world in which you find yourself to be a better one. But you'll have to be patient, courageous, and imaginative for that hope to be more than a fantasy. Now, in this quotation, we see a number of important tensions at work. First, there is the tension that while it is not our task to make the world good, we are not absolved from our responsibility to live in such ways that goodness is seen, experienced, and embraced in the world. Second, Hauerwas' ethics is based on becoming of a person of virtue who rejoices in the worship of God. So in a slightly different way to Mercy Amba Ordo Yoye, but keeping in the tradition of virtue ethics, exemplified by Alistair McIntyre, Hauerwas emphasizes the storied nature of the good life. What, what Hauerwas does is to place us in our right relationship to God and God's good world. Now sometimes when I listen to or read contemporary theologians, I have a sense that they have forgotten that God is the one who creates, sustains creation, and recreates the world. Now, of course, this does not mean that we are rendered passive or that we do not have any role to play in God's redemptive plan in the world. In fact, quite the opposite. It calls us to a deep discernment and radical political action. When we see that we or others are living according to contending stories, to half-truths, or to blatant lies about the good aims of the good creation that is created by the good God. In this regard, Hauerwas contends that, and I quote, one of the tasks of theology is to help us to discern how our lives may be possessed by unacknowledged stories that make our ability to live in gratitude for the gift of our existence impossible. Now let me ask you the question, what are the primary stories that shape your life? How do these unacknowledged stories relate to the story of the loving God who gave his life for our liberation, who longs that we would story our lives to the same radical love that can contribute to fullness of life and flourishing for humanity and all of creation? You see, to be virtuous, to be decent in the face of obvious indecency will require exacting action. Now, while there are traditionally seven virtues listed in the Christian tradition, there are 14 vices. Aristotle said that having too much of something, for example, being a glutton, is morally as problematic as not having enough of something, for example, experiencing hunger. A virtue lies between two extremes of vice. For example, to have too much confidence could result in recklessness, while too little confidence could result in fear. And so courage is the virtue that would strike the right balance between the vices of recklessness and fear. Now friends, this makes the task of the theologian significant. Theologians are not called to be smart. We're not called to be qualified. We're not called to be famous. We're not even called to be promoted. Well. <laughs> I said to Ashwin, if I could just get one well. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> you see, the reality is when we seek those things, we contribute towards the loss of power of our faith and the church, to witness towards God's good creation. And I believe that in recent decades, the church has lost much of its social power to form society. Now friends, here is the second surprise. I do not necessarily think that that loss of power is a bad thing. 
Because simply as I observe the church, I have noticed that we have not always done well when we, exi- when we exert social and political dominance. However, what does worry me is that we are increasingly losing our power even to form the lives of those who want to be Christian. How us once again places the emphasis for virtuous living where I think it rightly belongs. And he also relativizes the role of the theologian. Listen to this quote. He says, The church calls some out to think hard about the Christian faith. But I think you'll discover that the bearers of the virtues for sustaining the Christian faith aren't necessarily theologians. Instead, They're the people who day in and day out through small acts of tenderness and beauty sustain the kind of life we call Christian. How was his description of the virtuous person holds strong resonance for me with Vonnegut's description of the saints that he met? Now in this last section of the lecture, we're coming towards the end. Can somebody say amen? Load shedding at eight, and we want a glass of wine before then. In this last section of the lecture, I want to reflect on the virtues that I hope might shape my life and my scholarship as a South African theologian who hopes for a better world. And I want to begin with patience, which is the mean between the vices of violence and apathy. South Africa remains a deeply wounded society. 28 years after the end of political apartheid, the lived reality of the majority of young black South Africans does not differ all that much from the experiences of racial enmity, poverty and spatial separation that their parents, grandparents and historical forebears experienced growing up, first under colonialism and later under apartheid. South Africa has a predominantly young population Shockingly, 55.5% of the population live below the international poverty line of less than two US dollars per day. Friends, you try living that way. It's brutal. And the unemployment rate officially sits at 34.5%, with youth unemployment at 66.5%. What is of particular concern is that the injustices of white privilege and black subjugation continue to be evidenced in the economic and spatial inequalities of black and white South Africans at present. White South Africans earn on average three times more than black South Africans. And while white South Africans constitute less than 10% of the population, the ownership of private land by this group is 72%. Black South Africans constitute 89% of the population and only own 26% of private land. Friends, this is indecent. Achille Mbembe, an African philosopher and political scientist, notes that young black South Africans are expressing their political, social and economic discontent by turning to a politics of identity, a generational politics and a politics of impatience. And I must say to you, I don't find this patience surprising. The question is, however, if I recognize the importance of this patience, how could it be possible for a South African theologian committed to justice and decency to profess the virtue of patience? Well, the answer is, if I am to be a Christian theologian, I will need to take the sources and traditions that inform Christianity seriously. Patience features prominently in the Christian scriptures and in Christian discipleship. However, what we need to do is trouble, upset the popular understanding of patience as calling for a kind of passivity in the face of injustice and suffering. Now, many Christians would know that patience is listed as one of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. And I've often heard preachers employ this text to encourage people to remain passive and silent, even thankful in the face of injustice. I fear that such a view of patience may cause our hope for a better world to remain nothing 
but a fantasy. Now it's worth noting that the Greek word uh, makrothymio, as with most virtues presented in the New Testament, doesn't take its primary meaning from the historical, personal, or political situation it is engaging. Rather, it takes its semantic meaning from the religious and moral tradition in which it functions. Its meaning is derived from the theological beliefs of the authors and what they believe about the person and character of God and those who are to imitate God. To be patient is to retain a state of emotional calm in the face of provocation and misfortune, exactly as God does when God is faced with our sin. Now, this is the bit that I'd like us to think about. God's patience with a sinful humanity is not passive. It is not resigned to sin. God does not disregard evil or condone injustice. God is not indecently patient in the face of evil. Rather, as we see in the New Testament presentation of the life and work and ministry of Jesus, there is a kind of urgency and dynamism to set right what is wrong with the world. Yet there is a certain quality and character to the work of justice, liberation, and transformation that is presented in the telling of Jesus' life. His work of redemption is undertaken in ways that are not violent and destructive. Simply stated, we learn from the portrayal of Jesus and the theologies of some passages in the New Testament that patience is a virtue that is necessary to sustain a people, listen to this, who have disavowed violence as a means to settle disputes. As Robert Fosler writes, the relationship between the triune life and the Christian life requires imitation, imagination, and participation. We are to become as God is and live analogously as the persons of the Godhead live in relation to one another and creation. God's patience shows us that God will not deal violently with the violence and sin of injustice. Sisters and brothers, God does not crush or defeat us, but rather God seeks to liberate and redeem us. God redeems us from the perpetual cycle of violence evidenced in patriarchy, poverty, racism, xenophobia, and greed. Without patience, we cannot have true love that binds us to God and with one another. And yes, we will be frustrated by the time it takes to become the people that God wants us to be, but we must remember that we are living for a particular vision. Emmanuel Katangole calls this vision, I quote, a vision of reconciliation through the cross that builds upon the patterns of patience and courage that are necessary to redeem relationships, indeed all of creation, for the flourishing life. Now think about this for a moment. What is the alternative to the patterns of patience and courage that Katangole names? Surely as Christians we cannot achieve the redemptive aims by obliterating those who stand in our way. This would make us no better than those oppressors who sought impatiently to achieve their aims at the expense of those that they considered others. Dealing with the consequences of colonialism and apartheid while transforming society from benefiting a privileged few to meeting the needs of the many has proven slow and complex. And if we are to live with the hope of a better future, not only for ourselves and our children, but for all children and for the many future generations, we will have to make some choices about how we respond to the evils of our time so that we do not perpetuate the abuses, prejudices, and brokennesses that have made our current life so difficult. Another aspect to the virtues is they do not stand on their own. Patience is closely related to courage. Now, if 9-11 signaled the moment in history when contemporary geopolitics was forever changed, then the COVID-19 pandemic signaled a radical historical challenge of a more personal 
an existential kind. Who of us can say that we were not changed, or at least challenged, by the physical, psychological, and economic realities that COVID-19 presented around the world? We were suddenly reminded of our frailty, our mortality, and the injustices and indecencies of our social and economic arrangements, and these were exposed. Of course, the world is constantly changing. It was changing before the pandemic and will continue to change in the years ahead. In some sense, wise people do not just try to account for the nature of change, but rather seek to understand how they can remain constant, perhaps even decent, in the midst of perpetual change. A person of true courage can be trusted to respond appropriately, consistently, correctly, even decently in the face of crisis, challenge, and significant change. It is in this regard that I think the virtue of courage is important to develop in South Africa today. Courage is the power of the will to strive for what is good and right, even in the face of opposition, and to do so in a manner that achieves both the greater and the lasting good. Now, courage is not expressly mentioned as a virtue in the various lists of virtues in the New Testament, and perhaps this is because Christians are called to be a peaceable people. And in the earlier Greek tradition that predates Christianity, the virtue was largely associated with courage in battle. However, variations of the Greek verb, euthymio, are used in numerous instances. And it means to be, I quote, inspired with confidence or to be given hope. Now, of course, the presentation of courage in the life ministry and death of, Je of Jesus and the larger courage of the earlier disciples is presented as a virtuous example that we are encouraged to follow. This, in this regard, the virtue of courage was fully taken into the Christian tradition between the second and fourth centuries as it merged with the inherited theological understandings of the prophets in rabbinic Ju Judaism and early Christianity's understanding of martyrdom. The Hebrew prophets had the courage to speak divine truth to those who held political and religious power and even to declare judgment upon their own people when they identified practices and beliefs that were indecent and deceptive. While the early Christian martyrs were so deeply committed to the truth of God's love for the world and the living out of God's love uh, in the world, that they would rather die than denounce it. So while courage is often identified with heroism, I want to commend it to you today as a virtue of the everyday. Courageous people don't have to stop and think, how should I act with courage in this situation? That makes sense. Since their lives are constituted by habits of truth and constancy that speak of trustworthiness and decency, courageous people respond with courage because they live truthfully even in the presence of lies. And they know that they can live truthfully because they believe in a God who can be trusted. Rosemary Radford Ruther writes as follows, Fearlessness or courage is based on the grace of being both upheld by God and placing our trust in God. It is precisely this trust in God that enables one to speak truthfully and act justly without regard to those worldly vested interests that have a stake in the lies and injustice. Friends, simply stated, decent people do not lie. And they do not invest their lives in systems and institutions that perpetuate the lies of racial supremacy, economic inequality, religious bigotry, environmental injustice, and the like. Thomas Aquinas uh, associated the, uh, the virtue of, of um, courage not with soldiers but with martyrs. Now listen to this. Martyrs also resolve to face evil, even to the point of death. 
But instead of fighting with weapons intended to wound and destroy, they rely on the stronger weapons of faith and patience that are intended to heal and to restore. Interestingly, it's for this reason that Christian martyrs are not traditionally considered heroes, as their aim was not to defeat their enemies, but to endure in the truth and the hope that their enemies would be saved. I believe that it would take courage for us to continue to profess the truth of the vision of reconciliation through the cross, which is built upon the patterns of patience and courage that are necessary to redeem our future from the brokenness of our past. Let's turn to the final virtue. Now we are really at the end of the end. Say a double amen. Now, as I age, I've wondered how the story of my life will be told when it is done. I wonder also how the story of the Faculty of Theology at Stellenbosch University will be told. I even wonder about the church of which I'm a member. And of course, I also wonder and sometimes despair about how the story of South Africa will be told. We need to ask ourselves the question, can we imagine a future that looks different from our past? I started this lecture by saying that our lives are constituted by the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. I also mentioned that one of the tasks of theology is to help us to discern how our lives may have been possessed by unacknowledged stories that make our ability to live in gratitude for the gift of our existence impossible. As I listen to students and friends, to family members and politicians, to the news and the media, I have a feeling that we have lost our ability to imagine hopefully. I'm concerned that as Christians and the church, we are losing our capacity to activate a kind of prophetic imagination that can transcend the tragic experiences of daily life. While our existential realities are central to our experience of life, Christians believe that they do not constitute the end of history. We live with an eschatological hope for a time when all suffering and evil will end. And we understand that our lives are to be directed towards that end. Much of my work has sought to understand how our identities are formed by prevailing social and cultural imaginaries. Who and what we are as human beings, both as individuals and in relationship to one another and the rest of creation, is the stuff that makes up our inner lives. It's deeply private, and yet it finds clear expression in our public lives. What we believe, either knowingly or unknowingly, shapes our living, indeed, our, ho our, our, our whole lives. It has personal and political consequences. Charles Taylor calls this the modern social imaginary, and he deliberately employs the term imagine as it's often a clearer expression of how people believe their lives, both their identity and their interactions, are structured. Willie Jennings notes that Christianity, I quote, lives and moves within a diseased social imagination, and that the analyses of this condition don't get to the heart of the constellation of generative forces that have rendered people's social performances of the Christian life collectively anemic. I believe that one of the responsibilities of a South African theologian at this time in history is to try to identify and name what Jennings calls a diseased social imagination and what Hauerwas calls the unacknowledged stories that make the gift of our existence possible. How does one do that? Well, we can begin by distinguishing imagination from fantasy and ideology. And one way to do so is to conform our imagination to a story that is greater than our own personal desires and wants. For Christians, this means schooling our lives according to the truthful story of God's goodwill. An imagination that is built on the hope that comes from being shaped according to God's story does require patience and courage. 
since it is God's story. It requires courage to live according to the truth, and it calls us to stand firmly against the lies that seek to rule our lives. Thankfully, we are living at a time where many of us have had our optimistic illusions of control shattered. And so the Christian imagination expressed in the creeds and the scriptures and the historical witness of Christians in the church is a life-giving and transformative imagination. It is a prophetic imagination, and it is transformed and informed by the truth of God's will for humanity. So in conclusion, I feel compelled to assert that my work as a South African theologian is to profess and stimulate and cultivate a prophetic imagination with the churches and through the churches that can contribute towards the realization of justice, healing, and transformation. And I believe that that is a decent thing to do. So you may ask, why only patience, courage, and imagination? Well, they only gave me 30 minutes to speak, and I'm already at 40. <laughs> but of course, there are many other virtues that we will need and that we should cultivate in order to live more decently amid the current indecencies of our world. However, these three resonate with where I am in my story. And I feel that they may relate to the stories of others, the story of our nation, and I hope they even resonate with God's redemptive story. Moreover, I feel that we need to face the reality of the paradox that I mentioned at the start of this lecture. How is it possible that so many people in our country uh, claim to bear the name of Christ while we face such deep divisions and continue to live with such blatant injustices? The work and witness of many has guided me to this point and will guide me going forward as I seek to embody this profession in the years to come. As I thought of a truly decent person, one who serves as an example of living and working with a kind of decency that I've tried to point to above, I kept coming back to Denise Ackerman. She wrote that if public theology exists at all, it can be identified, I quote, in its broadest sense as being concerned with the common struggle for justice and the general welfare of people and their quality of life in society. I hope to be able to think and act decently as a public theologian who embodies this kind of virtue. I hope to do so with patience that works for radical change without resorting to violence or collapsing into despair. I hope to speak, write, and act with courage that is committed to the truth that we are created good and that our lives are intended for good, and to witness to a truth that unmasks the lies of the false stories that want to deform our common life. I want this work to be informed by a prophetic imagination that is aligned with the public aims of God's love for the world, an imagination that can provide political direction towards the good that we are created to be. And finally, sisters and brothers, siblings, I hope that you may consider joining me in seeking to live more decently amid the indecencies of our world. Thank you. COO, Dean, Head of Department, staff and students of the local faculty, local university, staff and students of other universities, church leaders, friends of Dion, family of Dion, and particularly Dr. Megan, Courtney, and Liam. I have a wonderful mandate. I am mandated by Senate and by the Chair of Senate, uh, Prof. Wim de Villiers, our Rector, to hand this certificate to colleague Dion, 
the certificate affirms, Dion, that you are now what you also write in uh, your lecture tonight, a specific thing. You use the phrase more than one thing. Now the thing that you are is a full professor of Stellenbosch University and I would like to You know, as a student at UWC, we listened every Sunday evening to Alan Busak. And he would then, every time when he preaches, then you think, ah, 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 that's what mama meant, that's what papa meant, the way he says, his, he says it there, that's what uh, my parents meant. And tonight I had the feeling with this phrase that, Dion, my world, at an inaugural lecture, I hear tonight that what my uncle said all the years, actually has theological significance. You know, he would ask you all the time, Nico, now you now stand at five, what next? Stand at 10, what next? And so when I became full professor, he then said, now you're going again somewhere to study. Man, what will you be next? No, uncle, you, there's no next. And then he said, from now on, I'll just call you a thing. There's no a dung. And tonight I hear, we, we, we're a thing. And on, on a serious note, Dion, you, have now the most senior academic position at a university. At this university, we very intentionally said we have a full professor, and when we move to uh, also the honor that be, we bestow for distinguished professor, we said we're not calling it a senior professor, and we're not putting it on a higher level than full professor, because this position is for us really the senior position and I want you to applaud our colleague again. So that's point one, only two more, as Robert had said. We must make three points, Robert. So Dion, in, in, in listening to you, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you tonight uh, really function with a non-pretentious understanding of public theology. To make it clear, public theology is not a new theology that seeks to replace cherished theologies like political liberation, black feminist, womanist theologies. You're not talking about a new discipline, sub-discipline, and you make space for people who perhaps use it in that fashion. But the way you want to use it is to say it's an emphasis, a focus, an approach. You particularly said even a diverse and divergent set of commitments and approaches and issues. Thanks for, 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 for emphasizing that. And the second point, you, you emphasize tonight what I think we really need so desperately globally and also here in our own country and in broader society and at our institutions, namely the notion of virtue. And you focused on specific virtues tonight, patience, courage, and imagination, but Dion, with my head on as member of the rectorate, I use your notion of virtue to perhaps say one or two things about the calling of you now as a full professor. And that is that a virtue, as you described it, is an, it's divine energy, it's an excellence, it's um, specific predispositions that we have, habits that we have, inclinations, tendencies, intuitions to be in a specific way and to act in a specific way. Your reference to Paul Ricoeur to to, to be and to act in accordance with, with what is wise and right and just and good, and we can even add what is beautiful and what is decent in terms of tonight's lecture. And if you look at the values of the university, we need those values, the e-care values, to be seriously become embodied values, lived values, practiced values. In a sense, we need to convert values 
to virtues, to things that are embodied and lived without even reflecting intentionally about it. And can we say tonight in congratulating you together with your little chesin that Dion, we see so much of this quest for virtuous living in you as a theologian and a gift to this faculty and to the broader university, broader church society, ecumenical church and broader society. We see in you excellence and we have these values. The first value of this university is excellence. Excellence in the sense of knowing what your specific telos, goal, purpose, end, calling is, and trying to, to exceed the expectations related to your specific calling and vocation. And it is, secondly, compassion is our virtue, especially in COVID time, we emphasize that. Compassion which is seen in the sympathy, dear one, that you show, the feeling with, the empathy, the feeling yourself into the skins of others, but especially in a pluralistic context, the interpathy, the Dion, you think yourself into the skins of people from other backgrounds, cultures, confessions, traditions, think yourself into and feel yourself into the skins of others. And tonight also your compassion when we have a candle here 10 years later and emphasizing in your lecture those workers of then and workers today are crying for a life of decency, compassion, dear, and accountability that we give answer, that uh, we give account of what we decide and what we do of our policies and our practices, and especially ask, give account whether it contributes to a life of decency for all. And your respect, respect to look, respect to look again, to think again, to acknowledge, to recognize everyone, especially the most vulnerable, Dion, and to say, that I really, I really affirm in advance your dignity, your worth, your value, your esteem, your splendor, your decency. And then our last value is equity. From John Calvin, I must combine the Methodist and the uh, uh, Calvinists tonight a little. A quiet us to say we want societies of higher acquietas, higher levels of equilibrium, so that some don't have too much and others too little. But equity that we see in you, Dion, also in your level-headedness, that we see how you help your students and colleagues and all of us to say, please, don't give in to the temptation of oversimplification. Don't join the choir of intellectual laziness. Don't join the flight from anti-intellectualism because it causes populist answers and we see how populism destroys individuals, institutions and societies. But we see in you that type of equity which says I must struggle with complexity. Yes, I must go to simplicity, but simplicity that really did struggle with complexity, with plurality and ambiguity, with ambivalence, with duality, with paradoxality, with tragedy, tragedy like this. Dion, you have a higher responsibility as a full professor to advance Values like e-care to impact not only on Stellenbosch, but to impact through Stellenbosch University on all spheres of life. And what a joy for an institution to know mandates like this can be entrusted to colleagues like this. Blessings and congratulations.